All right, we are back talking Baltimore Ravens football with a good old friend of ours, uh, Tony Lombardi from RussellStreetReport.com. Tony, uh, good to talk to you again. Thanks for doing this. Uh, my pleasure, Greg, and it's good to talk to you as well. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it, it didn't go as planned for Ravens fans, of course. No. They would have uh, much more enjoyed uh, just being at the Super Bowl a few days ago. But it is what it is. Only one team can hoist the trophy. And the AFC is just an incredibly tough conference. And we knew that before the season began. It was not going to be easy for anybody. Yeah, it was a, a real disappointing loss for the Ravens. And I still feel like they were the better team. They didn't play better that day, obviously. And, you know, you listen to Chris Jones from the Kansas City Chiefs defensive tackle talk after that game and said that the Ravens were the best team in the league, but they weren't the best team in the league that day. That's and the city had a better plan of attack than the Ravens. And, you know, I've been highly critical of John Harbaugh, Todd Munkin and Lamar Jackson in that game. And you know, I didn't mince any words. I said that they choked in the biggest stage of their careers at that point in time, not so much Harbaugh, but they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They abandoned the type of play that got them to the game to begin with. And, that's disheartening. Yeah. You know, when you lose, when you play the Super Bowl champion and you lose the turnover battle three to nothing, you're never going to win that game. With no. no, no, not against that man. And no. San Francisco found out how hard it is to beat Patrick Mahomes at this stage of his career, the way that uh, franchise is going right now. And especially when they have a defense, that's really what won the Super Bowl for them this year. You could say, of course, Patrick Mahomes is awesome, but it was the defense. They, they have not had this good of a defense before, and now they're going to be really scary if this continues. So. Yeah, their corners, they they're, they play so tightly that it changes the way that they play with the rest of the nine guys. You know, that Steve Spagnuolo can take chances that he probably couldn't without those corners. So props to him. And it's kind of interesting how well that defense has played all year, kind of kept them afloat when that offense was struggling. Yet Steve Spagnuolo gets no mentions in terms of a new hire for a coach because it's in vogue in the NFL to hire guys that are below 40 years of age. Yeah. Or, of course, if he was on the offensive side, he would. Right. He probably would have been gone two years ago. Right. So, yeah, that's uh, it is what it is. But who knows? Maybe Andy Reid decides, hey, you know what, man, I'm going to try to do something nobody's ever done before. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to coach this team, see if I can get a third Super Bowl. But you got to kind of figure that at some point he might just decide, okay, it's time to go. And then it'll be up to Spagnola and he'll still, if he, if that does happen in the next couple of years, he'll still have Mahomes for a, a, a good amount of production years ahead of him. So uh, I'm sure he's probably patiently waiting for that opportunity. Yeah. I think, and you know, look at the Kansas city chiefs roster and you see a lot of free agents, some big names on that list too, much like the Ravens. And yeah. Who knows if, how, what that attrition is going to look like come September when they tee it up to play again all over. I, I'm predicting that the Ravens are going to play against the Chiefs that very first game, that Thursday night oh, game yeah. about the season. It just makes sense. AFC, repeat AFC championship game, highly big draws on both sides of the football, you know, for both teams. And the Ravens are do have the Chiefs on their schedule in Kansas City. All right, Tony. Let's take an, an opportunity now to uh, go more in depth on uh, on these needs and go across the board as far as the depth chart is concerned. Because, matter of fact, I'm going to pop up uh, the depth chart here. Let's see what we got here. Doing all this for the first time. So, bear with me. There we go. All right. So, there is the Ravens, our lads.com official depth chart and we'll start on offense okay uh so we went over uh the free agents uh and that's key you got four guys right there uh at, that are potential starters or have been starters let's start at wide receiver because um yeah i actually uh, had beckman on my fantasy team this year and it was like one of those things where i didn't play him every week i only played him when i needed him and that and 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 so I did follow him a little bit more than normally I, I would follow uh, receivers, and it just seemed to me that there was no way that he looked like he was like a big part of the team. It was almost like yeah, he's a nice insurance policy, somebody that is a nice depth piece, 
and maybe he has a big game every three or four, but not for any way, shape or form uh, regarding like somebody that you're going to, you know, pay big bucks to. Uh, so how did, how was Odell's time with Baltimore and what does your gut tell you on whether or not you think he'll return? And then uh, you got the other two free agents as well. My gut with OBJ is that he's going to move on unless he takes a deal with the Ravens that has a, a modest base with some incentives. But I don't know that a receiver that has his resume is going to take that kind of deal unless it's the best he can do. But the thing with OBJ is he's performed at high levels before. But right now he's not that guy, and he's he seems to get nicked up. The re- reason the Ravens didn't have him on the field as much as maybe they did some of the other receivers, it wasn't because he wasn't one of the best ones. It was because they were trying to nurse these injuries. They were trying to lengthen his uh, his availability for, for the okay. season, have him ready for the playoffs. And, and even then they didn't use him all that much. So I think if he moves on, it's not a big loss to the team. I think that what he's done in terms of – helping the development of the young receivers is done. They kind of know, they get it now, and they're, they're more professional as a result of having the exposure to OBJ. But to bring him back on, let's say, I know our cap guy, Brian McFarlane, suggested a $6 million deal with you know incentives that would get him up to $10 million. But I don't know if, A, that's he's going to take something like that, and B, if even that's worth it for the Ravens. Uh, Duvernay uh, never seemed to work out as a third round draft pick. Um, and Aguilar is a veteran guy that should come cheap, right? Yeah, I think the projection on him is like $1.8 million. So he was a good guy in the locker room, loved playing for the Ravens. He, he was oftentimes on record saying that the Ravens have helped to rejuvenate his love for the game. So I think he'd probably like to stay around. I don't know what that number is going to be, but He's probably good for about 35 to 40 catches and, and a few touchdowns because he's got speed. He can get over the top. So I, I see him being a complimentary piece for the Ravens in the future. Okay. And by Bateman, how, how is he coming along or is he? Uh, first round draft pick, injuries, inconsistent play. What, what's his future like? Uh, one more year on the rookie deal. I probably like Bateman more than most Ravens fans do. I just think he's got the potential to be really good. I don't know that that potential has been drawn out of him just yet. Next year will be a big season for him because he's got that fifth-year option that the Ravens have to decide on. I think it's May 2nd or May 3rd. I don't think they're going to exercise that option because it's like over $13 million. Oh. I don't think they see him as a $13 million kind of player. But this means he's playing for his future, and I think that in year four, you might see him shine because he runs terrific routes. He just doesn't seem to be on the same page as Lamar Jackson, and and they've got to work on that in the offseason to make sure that they are. Yeah, and that is an interesting point because you don't know. Uh, like you said, sometimes there is that chemistry. Uh, mm-hmm. You have good chemistry, but you also have bad chemistry, and maybe there isn't good chemistry there. Maybe if Bateman goes to another team with another system, with another quarterback – that first round status will kick in who knows, but uh, maybe only Bateman knows more. There was a play in the AFC championship game where Lamar was scrambling out to his right and Bateman was working back towards the ball. You know, he broke off his route, working back towards Lamar and Lamar wanted him to streak down the sideline because Lamar could see that there was nobody behind him. If he took off downfield, but he did not. Conversely, same kind of situation with Zay Flowers. He did take off down the field, saw the opportunity, and connected on a big play. So they, they need to work on those kind of little idiosyncrasies, and it only comes from repetition. And and Bateman's repetitions have been somewhat limited in practice because he's had some off-the-field issues, not, nothing like domestic violence or anything like that. He's just had some personal issues that he's needed to take care of. And like any of us, if something is wrong in your personal life, you're not doing your job at 100%. He's now re-engaged, and I think he's gonna, you're going to see him have a really good uh, year four. Okay. Definitely an interesting uh, note there to keep in mind. Let's uh, talk then. Oh, and, and so if they do, because you have a wide receiver as your number one need for this offseason for the Ravens. So do you think it goes in free agency, or do you think it goes potentially as a – 
first round draft pick. And I do have to ask you about the draft capital first. So what, what what's the Ravens uh, draft capital at this point? Well, they have seven draft picks and it looks like they're going to get an eighth pick, uh, a fourth round compensatory pick for uh, powers, Ben powers moving on to the Denver Broncos. Okay. So it looks like they'll end up with eight as it stands today. Although it has been the Ravens, you know, MO to trade back in drafts and pick up some extra draft capital right now. It looks like they're going to have eight picks. And uh, at least one every round? I don't think they have one in the sixth round. They traded okay. that sixth round pick, I believe, to move in back into the seventh round last year to take Andrew Voorhees. Okay. And, which I think is going to end up being a good move for them because he's, you know, he's got the intangibles, great work ethic, and, you know, he had a productive college career. He hurt himself during the combines. And it took him out of the draft, so the Ravens moved up to get him in the seventh round. I think they they spent their sixth round pick in 2024 on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you uh, reminded me because I remember he was like a, a pro football focus is darling for yeah. like a couple of years as like their best graded, highest highest graded uh, offensive lineman almost. So that doesn't mean everything, but it does mean enough that it, it opens your eyes a little bit and say, what is seventh round draft pick? Like you said, injured. Yeah. Uh, coming in that off season. So yeah, that could be a very, and, and again, Zeitler is a free agent. So before we get into the offensive line, get back to my, my original question regarding wide receiver. So do you think maybe, because this is going to be a stacked deep wide receiver class, especially late first, second and third rounds. So do you see the Ravens, instead of going the free agent route, free agency route, targeting maybe a wide receiver as early as round one? They could. You know, it's been the Ravens' MO to try to, through free agency and let's say guys that are free agents on their own roster right now, to fill all of, to address all of their needs in a way that's sufficient enough so that on draft weekend, they can just take the best player available on their board, the highest ranked player on their board, regardless of position. So, I could see a wide receiver being uh, the position, but if there's an offensive lineman that they like just as much, chances are they'll take that offensive lineman over the wide receiver because the offensive line position isn't as stacked as the wide receiver position. Yeah, and uh, that's a great point there because that's uh, you could just wait until your very next pick and yeah. end up with a really good player in the second or even third rounds, and you just got to hit the right guy. Okay, right. so let's talk offensive line. We mentioned before Zeitler and Simpson. So those are the two starters, uh, both at guard. So obviously Zeitler's got the history of being a big time player. Um, is he still going to command big money on the market? Well, I think he's 33 years old and I don't know that he's going to get big money. You know, maybe he's a five to $7 million a year player. Okay. We'll, we'll see, but you know, he, he had, some ups and downs in 2023, but he finished the season strong. So, and I know that the Ravens want to bring him back and there's an important date on Monday, Craig, it's uh, the 19th is a day when teams have to decide or, or, or offer a new contract to guys who have option years. Okay. You know, those, those options, uh, avoid, uh, avoidable options are used to help minimize the impact of a signing on the salary cap. Well, those things are coming due on the 19th. Zeitler is one of them, but they can absorb that without an impact on the cap if they give him an extension. So it wouldn't surprise me if we heard some news between now and Monday about Kevin Zeitler coming back to the Ravens. All right. So Simpson, uh, what do you think about Simpson? Is he somebody that, because he's not going to cost a lot of money, right? Right. So he should be back, you think? It depends if they see some of these guys that they they have a, a draft pick escapes my my memory right now that they had maybe he's on your board here the offensive lineman that looked decent in in camp is it this it one here yeah that yeah. yeah yeah I knew I, I couldn't pronounce his name that's probably why I didn't remember what it was yeah that's why <laughs> I just said is it this guy <laughs> I wasn't going to be the one to butcher yeah that guy. So he actually played pretty decently in camp. Didn't see a lot of action in 2023, mm -hmm. but I, I think he's a guy that could be in the mix. 
Patrick McCarry is a guy that's always in the mix, but I think they just like him being that jack of all trades, a guy that they can fill in on any position across the offensive line. They like to kind of keep him in reserve. And you, we, we mentioned Voorhees. They've been Cleveland still around. He had a, you know, he got a little better, I thought, in 2023. So he's in the mix. Yeah. John Simpson, if there was a weak link across that offensive line in 2023, I'd say it was him. So okay. him coming back maybe as a reserve, maybe as a guy's familiar with the offense. But overall, I, I think if they don't improve that left guard position, they didn't improve the offensive line. Yeah, you would think that at some point, maybe even in the first round, they go – because do you think guard over tackle early or not necessarily? Um, I'd say the best lineman that's available. They typically – they've had a lot of success with guards later on in the draft. Okay. And Marshall Yond, a perfect example. He's a guy who was a third-round pick. He's arguably a Hall of Famer. Yeah. And then Falele. So Falele, he looks raw still to me. Speed rushers, he's like a turnstile out there. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned against, this, against certain teams. Uh, the Ravens did something in 2023, which was really interesting with their offensive line. They would have – rotations at the tackle position and the reason being is because ronnie stanley and morgan Bo moses were both fighting some injuries so they were trying to limit their snaps and manage it in a way that would help sustain them through the season but the the benefit of that is that the other guys got some added time at the tackle position one of those guys was patrick mccari so i mean we already know what we have with him but with filele he got to see some you know Heat of the moment snaps out there, you know, in competitive games where things really matter. And hopefully that'll benefit him going forward. But still, I don't know that I trust him as the starter on either edge, particularly. Well, he's not going to be a left tackle, but I don't I don't know if I trust him enough at right tackle just yet. And Moses, uh, so he's 33 and they mm -hmm. could probably I, I would guess he'll be back next year at right tackle. No reason why it, it's not Stanley and Moses again, but they have to obviously look at the future and the sooner they find another tackle, the better. Correct. It's that's, that is correct. But Moses is a guy who's, they love having him on the team because he, he always shows up for work. He plays just about every game. He's been very adequate at right tackle, not the best, but not the worst. And he comes at a decent price. So you put all those things in, into the mix. The Ravens have a credo, right player, right price. I don't see any situation where he's not that right player, right price, unless they're just so up against the cap that they've got to cut corners in a lot of different places. And he could be one of those corners. All right. And we don't have to talk about it. Well, Huntley is a free agent. No reason to think he won't be back. Right. Uh, he probably will not be back. You're talking oh. about the quarterback, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he's a free agent. I think for him, it's probably best if he goes somewhere else. He's very tight with Lamar Jackson, but they brought in Malik Cunningham from the uh, the Patriots when he, he was let go, and they put him on the practice squad. Then they had him on the regular 53-man uh, roster. There was even some talk to use him against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think he did line up as a receiver a couple of times. So, But they, they like his flexibility, and if you think about it, he's very <laughs> similar to the skill set of Lamar. Yeah, he is. He's not Lamar, but he's still no. – he has that skill set. So if you're building an offense around the league MVP and he happens to get hurt, why not have a guy who you can still keep the same playbook open for instead of a guy that's, you know, a traditional pocket passer? Uh, Huntley is, is, is very much like him. But I think that they brought Malik Cunningham in to replace Huntley, who they know is going to be a more expensive guy in 2024. Yeah, I, I didn't realize he would be, but yeah, he does have a lot of experience and he has been successful. So teams are looking for that number two guy and it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Right. Well, that's why you're on, Tony. No, that's why I'm not uh, talking and representing Baltimore Ravens football on this network. Uh, all right. So uh, Ricard, uh, by the way, uh, he just keeps going. I love Ricard, but... Todd Munkin, he didn't see as many snaps in Todd Munkin's offense as he has in the past when Greg Roman was at the offensive controls. Okay. So the talk in the airwaves around Baltimore right these days is that 
they want to bring Ricard back, but at a reduced number. I think his cap number is around five and a half million dollars. Wow. A fullback at five and a half million dollars, probably not the best use of cap dollars in, in this day and age in the NFL. He probably doesn't have a lot of options where teams will utilize a fullback, but he's a good one and he's he's a great team guy and willing to do whatever it takes to help the team win. So I think they'd like to have him back, but at a reduced price. Is there anybody else that, uh, because obviously we're going over the the free agents, but is there anyone else like Ricard that could either be a cap casualty or that definitely the Ravens are going to need to try and restructure their contracts? Well, Brian McFarlane, our our, uh, salary cap guy on Russell Street Report, he's identified seven guys who were eligible for restructures. One of them is Lamar, and that's a kind of a no-brainer. I mean, he's going to be around, so – you just restructure him. That saves them. Um, it moves $11 million into the future. So they have some $11 million of free space in 2024. Okay. So he's one of the guys. Mark Andrews, another guy. Marlon Humphrey is a guy. Uh, Justin Tucker was another one. I'm trying to think. Roquan Smith is another. So it's, if, if all these guys, all seven of those guys are restructured, it creates $43 million in cap space. But, okay. Uh, Brian doesn't think, and I agree with him, that Marlon Humphrey is, is they're not going to restructure his only because he's had a, a questionable couple of years and he's only 28 years old, but at the same time, he's a guy they've already restructured, I think, three times. You keep okay. kicking that can down the road, eventually you're going to have to pay for it. And and the last thing general managers in the league want is to have guys who don't perform to the level of their cap number, and, and that could be Marlon Humphrey. Yeah, as we slide on down to defense, that is – I mean, we might as well start there because I was going to ask you. I have it in my notes. Is Marlon Humphrey overrated? I think he is. I do. I think he's he's overpaid. He's not pay, playing to the level of his contract. Yeah. But I do believe that he could be a really good player still. He's best when he's playing out of the slot because he's a pretty good blitzer. He is a good run defender from the slot. And he's a guy that covers well from there. He, he's all pro season. I think most of his snaps were in the slot. So if they brought back Ron Darby, got Brandon Stevens on the other side, Marlon slides into the slot, they don't need to bring back uh, an Arthur Millette again. So uh, I think that that's where his future lies, but that's a lot of money to pay for. You're, you're paying for a shutdown corner who's playing slot, and, and that's not why you paid him the, that kind of money. But then again, I doubt that he takes a pay cut. All right, we'll keep an eye on that for sure. So he could be the biggest name of uh, potential cap casualties. I would be kind of almost shocked if they did that, but you know they, they probably are having conversations with him about taking something less. Okay, but, but I don't know if he, he's the guy that would do that or not. Well, then let's talk about the corners as you have as the team's fourth need, uh, fourth biggest need this off season. So, um, because you, you there are several free agents, including Darby, as you mentioned, Mollet Mollet is the other free agent. Um, but if Humphrey isn't really looked at, even though he's being paid like it as a shutdown corner, is that something the Ravens are looking at? They're looking, hey, you know, we'd like to get a, a true shutdown corner in this backfield. Well, yeah, I mean, you look at what the the Chiefs have done, and it's a copycat league, and you get a guy like McDuffie who's played so well at such a young age in, in big games. Of, of course, they'd like to have a guy like that that they can get one in the draft. I would think that if Ron Darby's coming back. They don't sign him until after the draft so that they see if they, if they go that way, they don't need him. But the Ravens have always taken the approach that you can never have enough good corners. And so they accumulate them. It wouldn't surprise me to have Ron Darby back and, and Marlon that ha, having the flexibility with Marlon to play either outside or inside. Okay. And Brandon Stevens, I know he was just a third round pick, but that that's fine. You're still supposed to be an impact player. Is he definitely – part of the future they're they're counting on him or is he somebody that could be replaced i don't think you can replace him right now i think he's his the arc of his career is really ascending and there was some talk that maybe they go to him now and try to get an extension with him really good guy good locker room guy works hard always is available i don't think he missed any games this year which is kind of tough for a he may have missed one game but when you add that all up and the price that they're paying him right now, he's he's great value for the team, particularly the way he's playing. 
Okay. So he's a good tackler. Uh, I think he mirrors uh, receivers. One of the issues I've had with him in the past is that he doesn't turn and look for the ball. He's right there in a position to, to make a play, but doesn't oftentimes make plays during contested attempts because he, he doesn't have his head turned. He improved in that regard this year, but I think he covered so well that he, a lot of times he wasn't targeted. And and so the, I think you got to bring that guy back. The Ravens are, like I said before, they're tight against the cap because they're paying him such a low cap number now to extend him would raise his cap number in 2024 unless they deferred some of that money. And, and that's possible too, but it wouldn't surprise me to see a Brandon Stevens extension before the season begins. Yeah. Ed, Ed Reed probably watches those games, watches Stevens and shakes his head. No, I mean, just uh, that just goes to show, I mean, when we, what a special player Ed Reed was, was that every time he was around the ball and could get his hands on the ball, he did. And then not, not, it wasn't just, okay, I've got an interception. Like a lot of guys in the NFL, they get an interception. All right. They run the ball back five or 10 yards. Ed Reed gets the ball after an interception, man. You watch out because chances are he might score. And he did that a lot, right? Or yeah. had big returns a lot of time. I think he, he's the NFL career leader in return yards for interception. So, uh, and he wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. 106 yard return against the Browns. I think 107 yard return against the Eagles. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. But yeah, he, he was certainly, when you look up Ball Hawk or you Google Ball Hawk, it's probably going to show Ed Reed's picture. Yep. Amazing. It just shows you when it's happening, maybe you just don't, you realize, you realize he's special, but it's like, you know, then you look around the rest of the league and say, like, where are more guys like that? How come we don't have more guys like that? But, sure. Yeah. All right. He wasn't well, the I'm, fastest guy on the field either. What was that? He wasn't really the fastest guy on the field. No, either. no. That just shows you instincts. Yes. It goes a long way. Okay. Let's talk about uh, safety. So Geno Stone, now they got Ravens, probably the best trio of, of, of safeties in the league mm -hmm. this past season. Because obviously Kyle Hamilton is just developed into a monster. And I remember when he was being drafted that year, I wanted the Jets to so badly get him. I thought that would have been a perfect fit for the Jets. But they had such a great draft in the first round. I'm not going to argue with any of the players they picked. But boy, does Hamilton turn into a superstar. And then you have, of course, Marcus Williams. Stone is a free agent. So is he going to be available? Obviously, what a get in the seventh round. Uh, do you think he's going to be overpriced or do you think he'll be returned somehow? That remains to be seen. My guess is that he'll be overpriced for the Ravens and they'll move on from stone. Had a good season. A lot of it filling in for Marcus Williams, who wasn't healthy the entire season. Again, you know, he hasn't really had a full season with the Ravens either the two years he's been in Baltimore. So they're hoping for bigger and better things from Marcus next year. Hopefully he'll be a healthy uh, stone will move on. The, the Ravens have had, have a history of doing pretty well deep in the draft or even undrafted free agents once they're next to another guy who knows how to play the game, position people. And, and I think when you look at the Ravens' history, you look at Chuck Clark, a guy who I believe was a sixth-round pick out of Virginia. And then you mentioned Geno Stone, seventh-round pick. He was cut at one – the Ravens had him on a practice squad. Then he migrated to, I believe, the Houston Texans who picked him up and put him on their 53 – at the end of that season, they didn't even put him on exclusive rights, the Texans. So he must not have done much there. He stepped up in a big way, made some big plays for the Ravens in, in 2023. He's gonna he's earned his next contract, and I wish him well, but I don't think it's gonna be with Baltimore because do they of, have, do they have someone Mark Williams and because you mentioned Kyle Hamilton. Kyle Hamilton's not a traditional safety. It, that's true. Yeah. He's like a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> yeah, that's what I love about him. Yeah. Yes. Yes, he's he's like a positionless player who's an all pro. Yeah. Uh yeah, because that was the talk, obviously, when he came out. Oh, he's too slow. Because everybody yeah. was talking talking, oh, he's gonna be watch, he's gonna be top five pick, top, which is where he belonged. You can see it in the talent. He should have been, but oh, he didn't run fast. So that's how There's it seems like the Ravens benefit. Yeah. Where's number 14 to remind everybody where he was taken? I love it. Yep. Uh, all right, so do they have someone on the roster right now that will replace Stone, or is that definitely going to, especially with Williams and his injuries, is that something that they're going to have to look into free agency or the draft? They, I think that that might be a draftable position for the Ravens to your safety. Like I said, they've, they've done well later on day three in the draft to find those kinds of guys, usually smart guys that, that have good ball instincts, and that was true of Chuck Clark. 
really true of Geno Stone. So there's probably another Geno Stone out there that they've already earmarked, and, and I expect them to make a play for somebody like that in the draft. All right, uh, linebacker, uh, the duo of Queen and Smith is as good as any out there. And Queen, I know we talked about uh, Queen the first couple of years uh, about him not picking it up yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he sure has uh, picked it up. So uh, is he going to, are they going to be able to bring him back? We haven't even talked about the tag. Is there going to be a player possibly on this team that the Ravens will tag? I think if they tag anyone, it will be uh, Justin Matabike. Okay. Because he's a guy who had 13 sacks, interior lineman, kind of unheard of, right? Unless you're Aaron Donald, but he had a, a terrific year and the Ravens have waited for a guy like that, that they can groom and have an interior pass rush because in this league with particularly in the AFC where the guys get the ball out so quickly, that interior pass rush is so important yes. to get those, those quarterbacks uncomfortable. So I think that if there's a tag to be used, it'll be for him. Although that tag is going to be expensive. I think it's like $20 million. So, and the Ravens will have to do some work to carve out enough space to have for not only with Justin, but also for in-season needs. So we'll, we'll see how that works out. But I think that if they do sign him to an extension, the cap number, according to Brian McFarlane, is going to be about $8 million if it's a market value deal. So, and that's compares favorably to $20 million if they tag him. Okay. And as far as let's get back to queen, then are mm -hmm. they going to be able to afford queen? No, no, okay. I think that, that's been an understanding of the team. It's been an understanding of Patrick's. I think that both the team and Patrick Queen have handled this perfectly throughout the 2023 season. Okay. He's, he's going to make a team proud because he shows up for work every day, plays hard on every play. He's learned how to really be a professional because he's played beside Roquan Smith for almost two seasons. And He's, we've just watched him as a 21 year old kid who had only played two seasons at LSU. That's all, that's the old, all the football experience he had become this man and this pro bowler. The Ravens would love to keep him, but he's just going to, he's going to probably want the kind of money that Roquan Smith earns and he deserves it. Yep. You can't have that on your team to have two guys making that kind of money. And it's why they drafted Trenton Smith or, or Trenton Simpson last yep. year to bring him along. And Simpson showed in that Pittsburgh game that one that didn't have any meaning on the Ravens standing that again, week 17 that or, or week 18 with the 17th game that he can play. He, he really moves sideline to sideline. Well, he reads and reacts to the run and he covers pretty well. And so all that, and he's a really good blitzer because he's fast. He's a lot like queen. So you get the guy, you know, if you can get, well, Steve Bashouty used to say, if we can get 80% of the production for 20% of the price, you got to yeah. do that all day long. And that's why we were just talking about needing to take somebody early for a, a position that might be available next year. That's exactly what the Ravens did with Simpson right. last offseason. Right. Exactly for this uh, scenario. Okay, so edge. Uh, the top two edge rushers mm -hmm. are free agents. Do you think either one will be back? Clowney, Van Noy? They love both guys. Both guys were great locker room guys. You know, you've heard all this, uh, the rumors about Jadavian Clowney, and, and you, he comes with this, you know, you think it's a checkered pass that he could be a, a locker room problem. He was anything but. Loved playing in Baltimore. I think they'd love to have him back. Had his most productive season with nine and a half sacks. Had another one in the playoffs, so he ended up with ten and a half over the course of, what, uh, 19 games. And then Van Noy had his most sacks in his career. Uh, he's he's actually said it depends on EDC. That's the acronym that they give Eric DaCosta. It depends on what he's going to do. But I could see one of those guys coming back. I can't see both. But I could also see both moving on. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing with Clowney is that nobody knows anything. It's just they just look at it and they go, well, this guy's going to a team every year. He's got to be a problem. That's what right. their thinking is. But, Probably, and I think the Ravens found out otherwise. Yep. And, he, you know, even when he wasn't making a sack, he was hurrying the quarterback, or he was just disrupting play and that he sometimes required two two guys to, you know, pay attention to him. And that frees things up for the other guys. So he, he was a force, and 
you know, everybody would like to see him back, but of course he's earned a big paycheck and we'll see how that works out in free agency. Yeah. It might be an opportunity now for him to finally settle down actually coming off a big year like this, the reputation, all of that. I don't think a team should feel in any way uh, if they've got the cap uh, money to spend, why not bring this guy in and right. give him a long-term deal? So, okay. Uh, and then, so what's up with Bowser and Ajabo? Well, let's talk Bowser first. Bowser didn't play it down in 2023. The Ravens medical staff checked him off, said that he's good to go, but Tyus Bowser never thought he was good to go. And each week, he, he, he didn't get paid in 2023. Wow. Because it was a non-football-related injury that he reported to camp with. And even though they thought he was good to go, he didn't think he was and never played. They got a weekly salary cap a credit of $250,000 every week he didn't play and never played a game. I don't think he's ever going to play another down for the Baltimore Ravens unless the market for edge rushers just skyrocketed so much and they can't get anybody else in uh, Baltimore through free agency or if Tyus takes a lesser deal. He's scheduled to make $5.5 million in 2024. They're not going to pay him that. He's either going to be cut or he's going to take a pay cut, uh, a big pay cut, and, and play for the Ravens again, almost like a prove it sort of deal. Because he's still pretty okay. young, and yeah. you know he hasn't played much in the last two years, so he's got a lot of juice left in the tank if he wants to play. And if he does want to play, and, and they get him on a prove it deal, that might work for the Ravens' benefit in 2024. Yeah, you would think that there would be some team, some general managers that would be skeptical of signing him. Because no, some no about it. Yeah. Some GMs are like, yeah, if, if, if I don't think you love the game, don't want to pay you that kind of money. Uh, what about Ajabo? How is his uh, injury situation? Well, he, well, he first had a knee – or first had an Achilles, and then he had a knee. And they think he's going to be ready for training camp. And, you know, he's got a lot of potential. We, we saw it in training camp. In, in training camp, it looked like Ajabo was going to be better than Oway. And – didn't make it through. And all of a sudden the, the lights came on and the real game started. And what you saw in practice wasn't the same. It could have been that he was carrying an injury through the early part of the season and just broke down, uh, you know, two or three games into the season. So, okay. you know, he's got potential. We've seen it at the University of Michigan. He just hasn't done it at the professional level. So hopefully it'll work out for the Ravens and Ojabo in 2024. And Owe, is he now, And which because we talked about the – two guys that might not be there next year, the top two guys on the edge. Is he now ready? Do you think it's possible uh, to take that next step and be the man? I haven't seen it, Greg. I haven't seen him being ready to take that next step. It's almost as if what you've seen with Owe is what you're going to get. A guy who might give you five to eight sacks a year. He hustles, plays the run pretty decently he, he'll run you down because he's fast. He'll, he'll, he never he has relentless pursuit of the play. So those are all good things. But when you take a guy in the first round on the edge, you expect a guy that's going to produce 10 to 12 sacks a year. And I don't think that's ever going to be him. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and then, by the way, Ma uh, Malik Harrison, he's also a free agent. You think he'll be back? He is. I don't know that he's going to make a lot of money in free agency. Uh, it could be a guy that the Ravens bring back. They like him for special teams. They like him for, you know, early and down and distance situations. They like to have him out there when there's uh, they think the other team's going to run the football. Uh, he hustles. He's a good athlete. Uh, I could see him coming back on on a team friendly deal. Okay, and a defensive line. You talked about Matabuike, so we know how good he is. Uh, he'll be back at some. No, no question. If they have to tag him, Urban's also a free agent, and. Uh, Travis Jones, is he ready, by the way, to take another step? Travis had some spurts in 2023 that looked really good. And, you know, the, the Ravens had touted him as like their favorite defensive tackle in that 2022 draft. And, you know, I thought that that was just them spinning the value of that pick. But he showed up at times. So I, I think he's developing. I think he's going to be a really solid player. And I think he'll have a better 2024 than he had a 2023 because that's kind of how the arc of his career is going. 2023 was better than 22. So, uh, yeah, I think he, they're looking forward for bigger and better things from Travis Jones in, in uh, this coming season.
Do you think everybody will be back, including Urban? I think Urban will be back. He'll be he'll be back probably to that, that minimum deal. Loves playing in Baltimore. I, I don't. There's this show that the Ravens produce. It's called Ravens Wired, and they put it out every week. And he and uh, Michael Pierce are like the best. They're best buds, and they ha- they sit together on the bench all the time. And they they mic those guys up oftentimes, and it's really comical the, the things that he says. So I, he loves being in Baltimore. I I think he'll be back, and um, he's. He's a good rotational piece for the Ravens off uh, defensive line. Uh, we don't have to talk much about special teams because with John Harbaugh, you know, there's always going to be a good special teams unit. And it is with the two kickers they have. I, I can't imagine that there's another team in the league that has that combination. So uh, they're kind of set there. Uh, and and how's, how were the units okay this past year? And with Duvernay being a free agent, is that something that they're going to have to look into replacing Duvernay? unless he comes back on the cheap. Duvernay, they'll probably, yeah, they'll have to replace him as a returner. He's not coming back unless he takes a vet minimum deal. I, I think Duvernay is one of those guys that needs a change of scenery. He needs to go and try to be productive in someone else's offense as a receiver. He showed flashes of that earlier in his career, but he didn't show any of that in, in 2023. He's very stiff in the hips. I think his change of direction skills aren't all that great. For someone, he's a good, you know, straight line. He's got good speed, but he, his change of direction skills are less than adequate, I think, for someone that plays that position. So I, I don't know that he'll be back. Um, okay. Like I said, he's on a, on a cheap, you know, veteran minimum deal, but I don't see him taking that. He, he needs to change the scenery. I want to wrap up with, uh, we, we opened w- with it a little bit about how the team ended the season and Munkin. So I have to ask you, uh, does, does, does he get deservedly uh, all of the criticism regarding the team didn't run the ball enough, whatever you want to say? They're always everybody's when you're supposed to be the team to beat, somebody's going to get right. criticized. So was he justifiably criticized? I think he's justifiably criticized, but I don't think that he's alone in, in being at fault there. Uh, and I'll explain the other two guys I thought I mentioned at the top of the show that who choked. I thought Harbaugh choked. I thought Lamar Jackson choked. And and here's why I say that. If Harbaugh is the head coach, you know that the running game was a huge part of what got you to that point in the season to be in the AFC championship game, to host the AFC championship game. And you only give the ball to the running back six times that whole game. It, it wasn't like it was a two score game at worst. You know, it was 17 to seven. And, the Ravens can put points on the board quickly if they want to, or if you know they have the ability to do that. So getting away from the run, I think that falls on the res- uh, on the shoulders of Munkin for not calling the plays, if that's in fact how it went down, and Harbaugh for not enforcing it. From you know, the, he's the skipper. Yep. We need to run the ball more. We need to call more run plays, Todd. And that didn't happen. But one of the things that came out in the post game press conference, and maybe you can read between the lines, but. They made it sound like the RPOs were a big part of what they wanted to do. And they said that the uh, the Chiefs were lined up in the box more times than not, eight guys in the box, which prevented them from running. And since it's a read pass option or a run pass option, that he decided, Lamar decided to pass more than run. And there's probably some truth to that. I don't know that it the responsibility falls on any one of them individually. I think all three of them bear the brunt of what went down in that game. And I also thought that Lamar had opportunities to run. He like Patrick Holmes in the Super Bowls had the opportunities to run. He took them. Yes. Patrick Mahomes, not the runner that Lamar Jackson is. Oh no. No. So I don't know. There were times when Lamar had an open field to go and run and chose to throw the ball downfield instead. And that was a source of frustration as well. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, with McDonald gone, and now this is what – is this three defensive coordinators in three years or four years? Uh, well, Mike was the coordinator in 2022 as well, and then prior to him it was Wink Martindale. Okay. So they, they, um, uh, McDonald was in Michigan for a season with Jim Harbaugh. He was a Ravens assistant prior to that. It's almost like they sent him on a on – a, a school to how to be a coordinator in central commission and brought him back. And it worked yeah. out well for him, obviously uh, we're, we're sorry to see him go. Uh, but you bring up a good point, Greg, and that there's a lot of transition with the Ravens in their coaching ranks. You know, you lose Anthony Weaver to Miami, you lose um, 
Denard uh, Smith to Tennessee and as their defensive coordinator. And you lose Mike McDonald, your own defensive coordinator. You elevate Zach Orr, who I think will do a good job. But that's a lot of coaches to lose. And then on, on the other side, in the front office, you've got Eric DaCosta's right-hand guy for a number of years. Joe Ortiz is now the GM for the Los Angeles Chargers. So, and, and then there's some other guys. There's an analytics guy that went with Joe Ortiz to San Diego or, or to Los Angeles. I still say San Diego. And and so that, there's a lot of losses in that building. And it remains to be seen whether they can make up for those losses in one season. I think 2024 is going to be a challenging year for the Ravens. And I would be shocked if they produce the same kind of record in 2024 than as they did in 2023. Yeah, especially how tough that division is. It's yeah. a monster division. Yeah, Pittsburgh is going to get better because they're going to fix their quarterback situation somehow. Whatever they do, it's going to end up being better in 2024. They always have a good defense. And they got a good running game, so they'll be competitive. You know, there's talk about Kirk Cousins possibly going there or Justin Fields. And so we'll see how that all shakes out. But they already let go of uh, Mitch Trubisky, so uh, that uh, tells you they're going to make some changes at that position. Yeah. And then Watson and uh, uh, how can I not remember? Joe Flacco. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I was going to say Cincinnati quarterback. uh, Oh, Burrow. Burrow, how can I not remember his name? Uh, yeah, but he's just, uh, uh, no question about it. Well, I don't know if the the Bengals will be able to keep T. Higgins or not. Well, that remains to be seen. But uh, they, they've got some free agents, and I I saw today on Twitter that uh, Joe Mixon's probably out at in Cincinnati. Yes, yeah, I spoke to John Sheeran, who, who does a good job covering the Bengals, and he did say chances are they're going to tag Higgins. Okay. Uh, more than likely, they're going to try to keep him. Um, but. Uh, yeah, Mixon, he did say Mixon probably uh, not going to be around, like you said. So, But they got a young player, nice little running back that's uh, ready to step in. So they it's going to be a really tough – again, you know, like you said with Cousins going to Baltimore, so, I mean to uh, Cleveland, uh, to Pittsburgh. It's like, yeah, all right, bring more NFC guys over to the AFC. That's just what we need in the AFC is more coaches and more quarterbacks and just you know, just make it easier for the Niners and like the Eagles or whatever so they just have to play each other like in the championship game every year while the AFC murders itself in the, in the postseason and in the regular season. So – well, you look at Kirk, a guy like Kirk Cousins. I know there's some talk about him going to the Falcons, too. So he probably wants to go to a team that he's got a chance to win because God knows he's made enough money for yeah. his level of play, right? Yeah. So uh, the, the Steelers, I could see that being a good fit for him. You would think so. Yeah, unfortunately. I hope not, but you would think so. Bears, they have, uh, they've got everything in their hands now. It will be interesting. What's your gut tell you? You think they're going to go after Caleb and Trey Fields? I, I do. And it depends on what they get for Fields. What, what do you think the market is for a guy like Fields? Uh, Can't second be. Second's got to be the highest. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think you take it in that respect. But still, I don't know. It'll, I Look, I don't know Fields. But from from my perspective, I would, I would keep Fields. From my perspective. Because mm-hmm. I think he still has an opportunity to be a good quarterback. And why roll the dice? You could say with every, anything, anything you want about can't miss – don't tell me. I, I'm sorry. I just don't put Caleb Williams in Peyton Manning or, or, or even in that category. I just don't. I mean, there's, I, I think he's got great talent, but I just, I don't think he's can't miss. I just don't. It, I guess it depends on if these teams fall in love with, with Caleb, you know, because look what happened in Carolina. They fell in love with the wrong guy. Yeah. So, but I, I hear you what you're saying. I mean, if, if you keep Justin Fields, you've got some, Heavy draft capital where they have two of the first four picks, something like that. Yeah, that's you can get you can improve your team in a fast way. Yes, if you use those picks for somebody other than a quarterback, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. It's like just do that, you know. It's yeah. like sometimes you just, you know, what they say sometimes the best moves are the moves that you don't make. True, but anyway, that's the Bears' problem. All right, it's gonna be a lot of fun though once they do make that decision. That Point was, it's going to open things up for the rest of the offseason. So we're really looking forward to that. And Tony, I appreciate it as always. Uh, so for the fans out there, RussellStreetReport.com, that's the website to go to if you're a Ravens fan and uh, podcast, things of that nature. Where, where, where do we send them? We have a podcast called The Front Office. It's on all your, where you get your podcasts. We're on all the platforms. So that's what we do. We, we, we do that on Wednesdays. It's uploaded on Thursdays. So uh, it's a good one. We're, we, 
Uh, Brian McFarlane, our cap guy, is very involved in that. And, and this week we're going to probably reach out to a, a GM or two to try to get them on the show because we want to talk about, for Ravens fans, the what it's like to actually have to go through the transition in the coaching ranks and in the front office and what kind of implications that has on an organization. Awesome. And uh, do you also post these shows on YouTube? Uh, we haven't, but we should. Oh, okay. We could, probably, we could probably talk offline about that. Um, but yeah, that's that's something we should do as well. Uh, we haven't video recorded them like we're doing this here. We just do those on, on audio because uh, we, we found that most people are just riding around their car listening to it anyway. So we haven't, we haven't done that. But at the same time, it's something we probably should consider doing because YouTube obviously is a huge platform. It is, but sounds like, uh, and I'll, we'll definitely make sure uh, to provide a link as usual in the description uh, area of this yeah. video, which is available on YouTube, including, of course, on our lads at our Uh We'll have the videos also at our lads new YouTube channel and my YouTube channel at Prime Sports Network. So uh, look at that 59 minutes and 39 seconds. Hey, I knew this was going to be an hour show, I just knew it. We hit it on the head if that's what our intention was. But anyway, we'll go with that. Talking to you, looking forward to uh, talking to you during the year too. Absolutely. Hopefully, we'll talk at some point uh, right after the draft and when the off season's over. Sounds good. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Tony.